So the next session is on crypto. We continue the conversation on crypto. It's the most popular topic and uh, DeFi regulation, how to think about uh, regulating decentralized finance and also quantum computing. So we have uh, four great speakers and Andre to moderate the, the discussion. I am going to give you a brief introduction for uh, Andre, who uh, is from uh, U of Cambridge. And uh, so he is well known to be an academic innovator or a research entrepreneur. Why? Because everywhere he goes, he set up a fintech center. <laughs> uh, the first one was at MIT, and then he moved to Imperium. He started a new fintech center, and the most recent one is at U of Cambridge. So, uh, and so he actually he was a chief economist at the CFTC. And that was where he uh, played a big role in designing effective financial market regulations. And so he, his, his work has been globally uh, recognized. So, and often you'll find this talk very interesting because he often tried to leave a really unique takeaways that you can't find anywhere else. So here's Andrea, his... go ahead. Uh, are you muted? Of course I am. So uh, here I am. Thank you. Thank you so very much for this uh, for this kind introduction. Uh, I, it's uh, it's great to be here. Uh, wish we were all together in Philly. Uh, really miss meeting people uh, face to face. Um, we have a great panel for you today. Uh, we have uh, four participants. In uh, we have. Uh, Dan Gorfine, who is uh, uh, formerly from the CFTC, but now runs his own shop. We have uh, uh, Hannah Halaburda, who is the uh, professor uh, at uh, New York University. We have uh, Chris Hansen, who could tell us quite a bit about uh, technology and regulation and how they and how they meet finance. And we have Mark Jackson, who can uh, tell us quite a bit about quantum computing. Uh, so we have uh, participants on this panel who could provide sort of uh, different perspectives on where uh, decentralized finance, uh, fintech, crypto assets are, where they think they're going, and and uh, and hopefully say something. You know, our goal is in preparation for this conference is share with you something that you otherwise wouldn't be able to read in the New York Times or or Wall Street Journal or Financial Times. So uh, uh, I'll ask each of the participants to uh, briefly introduce themselves. And uh, to each one of them, I pose a question. Uh, what is uh, or where the most interesting, surprising, important developments to you, to them, in crypto, blockchain, DeFi space over the last year? Uh, so we'll start with, I guess, in alphabetical order, we'll start with Dan. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Andre. I think the, the first and last time that I saw you in person was in London. So hopefully, yes, we get to do things in person again uh, sometime soon. And thank you to Jalapa and the, the Fed for having us today. This is a great, uh, great group and a great discussion. So my name is Daniel Gorfine. I'm the founder of Gattaca Horizons, which is a fintech advisory and consulting firm. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor and I teach fintech law and policy at Georgetown Law. Um, I'm the co-founder and director of a not-for-profit called the Digital Dollar Project, which is focused on exploring a U.S. central bank digital currency. And as you mentioned, Andre, um, I've previously served as chief innovation officer and director of Lab CFTC uh, at the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission. So, you know, you ask what, what's surprising, and you've set a high bar saying that we've got to beat, you know, the Wall Street Journal and New York Times. So I, I, I hope we can uh, live up to that. But, you know, you talk about the past year and I'd say in crypto, a, a year is like dog years. So it's really, you know, like 21 years of development has, has or sorry, seven years of development has occurred in just the past year. Um, but let me boil it down to three things that I think whether surprising or, or at least worth pointing out. Um, the first is everyone's aware that crypto total market cap had surpassed three trillion dollars uh, over the past few weeks. And. That, that is truly remarkable growth. And I think that it is evidence that this is no longer just a retail phenomenon, but also uh, it kind of marks a lot of institutional interest uh, and demand to get into the space. 
And from a regulatory perspective, I think that also points out the need for commensurate and mature regulatory frameworks to go alongside that development. Um, the second, which I know we'll come back to in more detail, is that, yes, DeFi, decentralized finance, is, is certainly gathering a lot of attention. Um, but I would just offer here that, you know, perhaps we're asking the wrong questions around DeFi, both from a market and a regulatory perspective. Um, you know, from a market perspective, people seem very focused on the assets that are being traded in the DeFi environment uh, or the, the assets that are being lent rather than focusing on the plumbing and software that's largely automating certain financial market processes. So I think that's the interesting question to ask is like, what does this push to, to automation mean for how we transact in all kinds of assets? From a regulatory perspective, we're a little bit in a, in a spot of trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. We want actors in financial services to look like traditional intermediaries so we know exactly how to label them and regulate them. Um, but I suspect that this is going to require broader thinking and we'll have to actually shift some of our regulations to accommodate some of these developments. Um, finally, uh, you know, wh whether it's private sector stablecoin efforts or other global central bank digital currency efforts, it's seeming to me like very clear, and I hate the cliche, but I think it's true here. It's, it's more a question of when, not if, with CBDC. And I think what people are focusing in on now are, are the critical design questions. I mean, there's so many open questions as to how you would implement a CBDC. Um, but again, I think we'll come back to some of those themes. So I don't know. Did I make the New York Times? Probably not with that. Okay, we'll try again. We'll try again then. So, <laughs> oh, so you, you, you've okay, ruled. I thought, I thought, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so the, the bar is still standing there. So, Hannah. Um. Hey. Uh, so, uh, I also want to thank uh, Lapa and uh, for inviting me to on this panel and uh, Andre for moderating it. Uh, my name is Hannah Halaburda. I'm a professor at, uh, at NYU Stern School of Business. Uh, my research focuses on intersection of economics and technology. Uh, before uh, before uh, Stern, I was at the Bank of Canada uh, also researching digital currencies. Um, I teach a variety of courses on fintech and blockchain. Um, and, uh, and my, my focus is, is basically how technology is affecting, uh, affecting economics. And this is also what I, what I see as fascinating, uh, in this, in the blockchain and crypto space and DeFi space, uh, over the past year. So. I um I want to point to two developments. So uh, then the the first thing that I find absolutely fascinating is flash loans. Uh, so and they have been um, maybe technologically it was possible to do them right from the beginning of smart contracts, but they were utilized over the uh, the past year. Uh, flash loan allows for um, borrowing uh, of a token doing something with the token, like exercising arbitrage, uh, or maybe voting it, if it's a voting token, and then returning the token uh, in the same transaction. And here technology is assuring that either the whole of the transaction is executed on, or none of it. So there is no technical possibility to be left hanging with just with with borrowed token that does not bring the profit and we need to or on the other side, it is not possible that somebody is going to uh, borrow token from us and not return. And this uh, this is an example of how technology is fundamentally changing the risk of a transaction. Uh, so, so this is this is the first fascinating development. The other one is what I am seeing in the the past year is the possibility of creation of new markets. We have seen a little bit of that, but I think we have it's just the beginning. So, uh, you know, especially I think that the new markets will be created and are already created with a combination of fungible and non fungible tokens. So, yes, there are like, you know, non fungible tokens around, around uh, related to art, and everybody has heard about um, Beeple's. Uh, uh, Beeple's auction on NFT of his fifth, first fifth, fifth, 5,000 days. But those NFTs are less interesting because, you know, you buy them, you may trade them, but they're just sitting there. 
Even the very first NFTs, CryptoKitties, that were developed in 2017, you could do more with them because you could breed them and then sell more of them. You could make more of them. But uh, now we have NFTs that you can breed them, you can raise them, and somebody else can be it on the outcome of the race, right? Like in horse races. And uh, and even, even more recently, we have uh, other um, kind of setups of ecosystems where you can create NFTs you can breed them because this is like really easy thing to do uh, with uh, uh, with software. But then you can have all sorts of economic activity around it. And we are not, uh, we haven't seen the full potential of that yet. But it creates new markets that were not there before. Uh, just like the video game markets was not there, not, what not, was not there before. Or uh, if we think about the mobile ecosystems with applications we did not have it before the development of the internet so i think that nfts combination with uh with fungible tokens and automation is going to allow us for creation of new markets really cool thank you hannah uh chris thank you andre and thank you Jalab, for having me uh great to be here uh, basically, my background uh, has been about 30 years of uh, shipping code and sometimes bugs. And uh, for about 15 of that, I've been building uh, software and financial services and fintech. Uh, I was a chief architect in a bank. Um, I, uh, I was uh, a, a developer uh, of a crypto project. Um, for the last few years, I've been in the challenger bank space. And now at Singtera, uh, I'm building a, a marketplace that connects fintechs to uh, financial services organizations, primarily banks, community banks, and uh, and banking related capabilities. What's what I'm what I'm the most surprised with, I think, when it comes to uh, the world of uh, DeFi and crypto, is really just the convergence that I'm seeing. Like there there was a time in in my world where the world of crypto and the world of, of banking were two very separate worlds uh, that you know would 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 never sort of feasibly connect. And uh, what I'm starting to see, and I was just recently at an event uh, called Money 2020, and I was just surprised. I mean, there were you know there were there were sponsors that were sponsoring the hotel cards that were supporting Bitcoin custody. Um, so the, the the distribution of 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 crypto as something that is converging with financial services was a surprise and something that uh, that I think is really interesting. The other thing is just the breadth of the use cases. Um, there was a time when everything in DeFi was, you know, very sort of retail focused use cases. And now we're starting to see custody. We're starting to see lending. We're starting to see, um, you know, all kinds of money movement scenarios. So to me, it's, it's about mainstream and, and also the breadth. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. It's very interesting, super interesting. I think I, I, I can hear a theme emerging already from, from the three of you. Uh, Mark. So, uh, so hello, everyone. I'm Mark Jackson. I'm the quantum evangelist at Cambridge Quantum Computing. My background is in physics, actually. I did string theory and cosmology for many years. And then about four years ago, I joined Cambridge Quantum as the first US employee. And uh, in my current role as quantum evangelist, a lot of what I do is popularize and uh, be the exponent for quantum technologies. Like many new technologies, quantum computing is largely misunderstood. And so a lot of what I do is communicating how uh, I think what people don't understand is quantum computing is here. They Many people seem to think that it's sort of a science fiction or buzzword or something maybe 20 years from now, but they don't understand it actually is here. We do have working quantum computers. They are not quite at the point where we can do something commercially feasible, but we think that could change in as soon as three years. And so, um, so a lot of what we do is speak at conferences and, and things like that. There are very direct applications to finance, obviously. Uh, there's cryptocurrencies and blockchain, as well as trading algorithms. Um, groups like JP Morgan, JP Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs already have fantastic quantum groups. So, uh, so this already has entered the mainstream in finance. And so I, uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak more about that today. Thank you very much. I think the theme that, that, that I've heard emergent from, from you is uh, 
you've all in, in some way said uh, how fast things are moving. Things seem to be moving very, very fast. Dan, you said that one year and one year, so many things happen. Anna, you said that new, new markets are, are emerging. Uh, Chris said, you know, just surprised just how just how quickly this is happening. And, 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 and Mark said quantum computing is here. So, you know, it's not like uh, it's science fiction. It's, you know, the developments are, 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 are happening. So I, perhaps I'd like to start with, um, with uh, go, go, go back to Dan and ask him uh, perhaps if from his regulatory days, uh, the uh, technology and finance are moving very, very fast. Uh, what about regulation? Where do you see uh, things happening? What is holding things back? Is it the uh, existing regulatory mandates that basically just constraining regulators in place and they can't, I mean, they have a, they have a legal mandate. That's what they are supposed to regulate. And until they get another legal mandate, that's, that's basically what they need to do. Uh, it used to be perhaps knowledge in the past, but now we have, you know, my, my former boss, you know, Gary Gensler, who followed me to MIT and back. So, I mean, you wouldn't say that these people are clueless, right? So, I mean, he was teaching blockchain and crypto assets. Uh, what else? You know, what, what, where do you see things happening? What's, where is regulation? What's holding it back? Or perhaps it's not holding back, but it, what speed is it moving on? Well, you make, you, look, you make, not just in the U.S. Sure, sure. Well, you make a really important point, and that is that, you know, regulators see the world through the statutory lens that they're authorized to see the world through. And I think that's a really important starting point, especially when you do talk about U.S. regulation. Um, it is fragmented, right? It's fragmented across a number of different federal agencies as well as state agencies. And I think that's something that people frequently forget um, let me do this, and, you know, to, to, to tackle this question, I'm going to start with just a really, really quick lay of the land. Like, what, what, what are those lenses that all the different regulators are looking through? And then what's on the agenda as of right now? But I will kind of cut to the chase and answer your, your ultimate question, which is, you know, absent, in, in my view, absent some type of a cohesive national policy around where you're trying to go, it will remain a fairly fragmented environment. And again, that's a function of the legal system. I mean, regulators can only do what they're statutorily authorized to do. So they look through their rule books at, at different assets and determine whether they have jurisdiction and how it applies. But again, let me, let me just level set. You know, at a starting point, I think one thing that's frequently missed in conversations about crypto regulation um, is that much of the activity is actually regulated today at the state level. So. You know, crypto exchanges are largely licensed as money transmitters at the state level. Um, there are some states that have kind of bespoke or tailored regimes like the bit license framework in New York, uh, which is overseen by New York DFS and is quite robust. Uh, but that's where a lot of the activity and it's, it's really at the state level through those types of money transmission or money um, uh, licensing frameworks. Now, at the federal level, you do have this overlay. I'll, I'll quickly tick through some of the major players. Right. So FinCEN. Uh, handles financial crime and suspicious activity reporting. So state licensed uh, money transmitters have to report suspicious activity to FinCEN. The SEC certainly gets a lot of attention in this space and, and, and for good reason. But it's also important to remind that the SEC's jurisdiction is implicated when you're dealing in securities. And there's a lot of activity in this space that falls outside of the securities world. Um, Acting Chairman uh, Benham from the CFTC recently pointed out that at least 60% of the crypto market is, is, is not a security, right? When you look at Bitcoin, when you look at Ether. So that means there's a lot of activity and actually the bulk of activity is still occurring outside of, of SEC oversight. The CFTC, my old uh, agency, there's also some misperceptions there. The CFTC does not regulate spot or cash commodity markets. So that trading, that cash trading that occurs on exchanges, that state-based activity that is not subject to CFTC oversight. CFTC oversight is implicated when you're dealing in futures contracts or derivatives that are linked to a commodity. Um, that's where licensure and oversight occurs. Um, the CFTC does have kind of backward looking enforcement authority over fraud and manipulation in the commodity markets, especially to the extent that it could impact the futures or derivatives markets. But that is a lot more limited than having an actual uh, central overseer of the space. And then in the past year, we've heard a lot about bank regulators, because certainly the bank regulators have a large say in how traditional banks get involved in the space. Can they trade the asset? Can they hold the asset and custody the asset? 
Um, can banks or should banks be the ones to issue, you know, so-called stable coins? These are all open questions. Okay. So given that backdrop, you ask, where are we going? You know, absent any dramatic shift in the U.S., which I don't expect to see. I mean, again, there's been some talk of maybe some type of a cohesive national policy framework that could originate from the White House. But absent that, you will continue to, to see a few things. Like one, states are recognizing that they do have a lot of authority in this space. And that's why you see a number of states uh, pursuing special purpose crypto charters, um, trust charters. They're, they're seeing this as a way to potentially attract attention. Then you have states like New York and the New York DFS framework, which is really well established and has been so for quite a long time. And a number of uh, crypto players are registered in, and licensed and overseen by New York DFS. With the other agencies that I mentioned, you know, you had a, a number of high profile ransomware attacks earlier in the year, uh, which got a lot of attention from FinCEN and Treasury. You know, I will say that while crypto has been used or at least demanded in many of those ransomware cases, I think the Justice Department's recovery of some of this of the, the Bitcoin that was transacted there in the colonial pipeline matter was really important because it demonstrated to the federal regulators and the public that Bitcoin is in fact traceable and it was recoverable, which I actually think kind of ratcheted back the pressure on crypto uh, following that very high profile issue. The SEC, you know, continues to be involved in litigation around the outer boundaries of what is a security. So there's some uh, case law that I think will develop that will help to define the SEC's jurisdiction. Um, they've been really active around ETFs, exchange, exchange traded uh, funds and products. Right now, they've approved Bitcoin futures based uh, ETFs, but not spot or cash market ETFs in part because of concern uh, uh, of the risk of fraud and manipulation in the underlying market. And in their most recent denial, the SEC said, you know, they're clear, there needs to be some type of a surveillance sharing agreement between the ETF and a regulated market of quote unquote significant size before they're going to get comfortable that they're properly able to police for fraud and manipulation. Uh, CFTC has also been active. They brought some enforcement actions against a stablecoin provider, um, also some crypto exchanges that were offering leverage trading products, and they continue to oversee, you know, regulated registered Bitcoin uh, futures products that can be either cash settled or physically settled. You know, I'm getting to the end of my list here, but uh, the, the last thing that I would want to highlight is that we had the president's working group issue their stablecoin report. I think that's a good example when you ask the question of what's likely to happen in the U.S. You know, the, the, the PWG report made some recommendations. They called on Congress to kind of mandate or define who it is who should be issuing a stable coin, but that's going to require Congress to act. And I, if I'm reading the tea leaves right, I think that's unlikely in the near term. Uh, the report also kicked the issue over to FSOC uh, to look further at whether there are any systemic risks involved. But again, I think that will be a, a gradual process. So what it means is a lot of the status quo will maintain, and I think a lot of the existing uh, regulators are, are going to continue to um, move forward under their particular rule sets. You know, I, I will I will say just very briefly on the DeFi track, and then I'll, I'll pause in case you want to go deeper. But I think with DeFi, there's definitely a lot of regulatory interest um, in this space. And I think it's a really interesting concept. Like I, I view DeFi as like a spectrum of activity. On the one hand, you have what's pure software and messaging. On the other hand, you have what's classic exchange marketplace activity. And then with DeFi, there's a lot happening somewhere along that spectrum. And it's about line drawing right now. You know, what's, what is a regulated intermediary? And my bigger question is, is if you want to apply regulations to these novel intermediaries, if you want to call them that, how do those rules need to change or adjust? Because clearly these don't look like the traditional actors that we've seen in the past. So I think there will be some potential like enforcement activity in the DeFi space, but I, I'm hoping to see policymakers be a little bit more forward leaning to, to understand that some of these developments are gonna impact all markets. It's not gonna just be this like niche area. And so the rules would probably need to adjust accordingly. You know, globally, I think some jurisdictions um, have been slightly more forward leaning uh, than others. It's easier when you are not dealing in a fragmented uh, regulatory landscape as the U.S. does. Um, but again, I think that co coherent policy around this is still a struggle for, I think, most countries to wrap their heads around. You know, so one of the other panelists made the point, you know, what is this activity? Is it market activity, payments activity? Is it plumbing and infrastructure? How do I wrap my head around what this means? And I don't think we're fully there yet.
Thank you, Dan. Uh, meanwhile, um, uh, so Hannah, you said you you, you, you study uh, the economics of of uh, behind DeFi. Uh, what is the economics behind DeFi from from where you see it? Where you know who who where are the sort of the you know the traditional concepts gains from trade or uh, surplus or reduction in frictions or network externalities? What which framework are you operating on? Well, so so we do see a lot of network externalities, but even before going there, I I think so. If you think about uh, the providers of DeFi, uh, they get um, a huge cost benefit of operating DeFi protocols rather than any alternatives, uh, whether it be it um, uh, internet, uh, the classic internet operated protocols without the blockchain, uh, or of course brick and mortar uh, type of uh, enterprise. Uh, so the the cost benefits come from uh, basically three sources. One is automation. Uh, the second one is uh, existing ready-to-use and shared infrastructure, which is a blockchain like Ethereum, for example. And uh, the third one is ease of access. And the ease of access is both on the uh, both on the side of the users and on the side of uh, of providers. Anyone can set up, uh, in principle, anyone can set up uh, a smart contract that is going to uh, to provide a DeFi type of services. Uh, so the um, the automation um, it really low lowers the cost of operation. Uh, it lowers the cost of us accessing a large uh, pool of users uh, from multiple geographies, which would be very difficult under um, under other other arrangements. Uh, the fact that the infrastructure is there is is already helpful. We do not need to lay new cables. We do not need to create our own blockchains for the purpose of creating our, of, of running our protocol. Uh, so it uh, so so it saves costs on many many dimensions. Now at the same time, there is a, a very large um, very large competition of DeFi uh, of DeFi protocols, exactly because everyone can set up a DeFi protocol, and that means that what we are seeing is a more of a winner take all type of dynamics, or at least we have uh, few hugely popular uh, protocols and DeFi uh, DeFi applications, and there is a really really long. Uh, long, long tail of uh, DeFi protocols that have been set up and sometimes never used or used very scarcely. So we do have the same kind of uh, uh, network effect dynamic and uh, winner take all dy dynamic as we see in internet businesses. And uh, for most of the successful DeFi protocols, we kind of see the uh, uh, see that the, the the actual so for example for for uh, lending and borrowing for liquidity pools we do need to have network effects and network effects uh, come into play drawing uh, in users because there is so much competition it's easy to access the network the Ethereum network uh, right now it is so much easier than it was five years ago. Um, so, uh, uh, so the so 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 the uh, the new users are going to join the most, the largest, and more, most popular protocols. So we kind of see this uh, big gets larger uh, dynamics. At the same time, what I want to emphasize is the risk. So automation and uh, and what we are getting from smart contracts um, is uh, significantly lowering risk. Uh, and it is significantly lowering risk for the uh, service providers because with smart contracts in DeFi, uh, the provider does not see the risk that the customer is going to use the services and not pay or is going to take off with assets as if you're thinking about uh, lending in a bank. Um, so uh, so those, those risks are, are mitigated or reduced to zero. The collateral is there and this allows for this anonymous interaction. And at the same time, the risk is not necessarily reduced as much on the user side, because we see two types of risks for users. First, the, um, the protocol may, uh, may have bugs, and we have seen a number of DeFi um, 
uh, DeFi protocols that would operate for, let's say, an hour, hour and a half, uh, gather 20, $200 million, and then they would crash because of the bug. Uh, and this $200 million was wiped out. There is nothing to, uh, no, nothing to, to, uh, no, no crypto. Uh, assets be, uh, that would that could be redeemed. Uh, at the same time, there are uh, DeFi protocols that are malicious. They are working well in terms of smart contract uh, coding, but they are outright Ponzi schemes, uh, and uh, and this may take advantage of the of the users. Uh, while smart contracts may be visible publicly, uh, it is documented that most of the users actually are not uh, able to scrutinize the validity of the smart contract and to see what really the smart contracts are doing. So this is uh, more or less like uh, us reading or rather not reading uh, of uh, you know, user terms of service whenever we are uh, downloading a new application. Uh, so, so those risks are not mitigated by the automation, but, uh, but the, a lot of risks are mitigated for the DeFi providers. So, so bottom line is it's really cheap to provide those services. People are drawn to the most popular ones. And once they are drawn in and they exchange money, then, uh, then it's, it's really easy to kind of uh, make money from the from transaction fees. Very interesting, Hannah. Chris, you are you're building a marketplace platform, right? So how how are you approaching it technologically? And and if you want to speak about economics, that's fine. If you want to speak about just only about technology, that's that's fine as well. Yeah, yeah. Happy to, happy to think about both. Um, I mean, the the way that we see it, um, almost anything that's interesting that's happening in fintech financial services and DeFi these days that's touching the customer is the product of some sort of partnership. And, you know, we, we, we've seen, you know, sort of partnerships forming uh, between regulated entities that really understand regulation, how to navigate, um, you know, how to, how to think about, um, you know, their book of record and, and clarity around, things like BSA, KYC, AML, um, and those that really understand go-to-market and really understand acquisition and really understand customer experience. And what we've seen is that if you get the partnership right, um, there, there can be magic that happens. And so you know, if, you, if you sort of point to any sort of consumer fintech success behind the scenes somewhere is probably some sort of partnership, or in many cases, many partnerships. Um, but, you know, getting these partnerships right is also tricky because banks are in the risk business and they're in the they're, they're assessing risk. And these partnerships have different sort of risk profiles. If I'm a fintech, one of the things that I want to do is probably um, diversify my product offering. So even if even if let's say I have a DeFi project and I've got an interesting and exotic crypto asset that's amazing maybe a crypto kitty, but it's a dog um, and it's fantastic. At some point, if I want to connect a card to that and have somebody tap a card at a store, I'm going to need to create a partnership with a bank. But not all banks are interested in the crypto kitty dog offering, but there might be some that see that risk and will price that risk and will assess that risk and will do that deal. This is sort of how we see the world evolving. Um, it's early days, like we're still in the very, very opening acts of, of DeFi and, and FinTech, um, but we see bridges needed between um, traditional players, banks, and new projects that have new ideas and, and new kind of go-to-market concepts. Thank you, Chris. Mark, uh, now for you to evangelize about uh, about uh, quantum, uh, how how close are we to commercial applications of quantum computing? You said it's maybe two or three years, but you know maybe you can unwrap it for us a little bit. Sure. So quantum computing was first suggested about forty years ago. Uh, it was actually the physicist Richard Feynman who realized there were certain problems in chemistry that would never be solved by traditional computers. So he suggested that we build computers based on quantum physics to do this. Back then, that was like Star Trek. No one knew how to do this. Uh, it, was a, it was a good idea, but no one knew how to actually build this in practice. Academics worked on this for decades, and there was a joke that we were always 10 years away. And that continued for about 35 years. 
about seven years ago, there was a big breakthrough that people sat up and realized maybe this was feasible. Maybe they actually could build this. And so that's when the whole commercial quantum computing sector really began. Uh, that's the, that's when our company started. Um, two years ago, there was a big development by Google. They announced what is called quantum supremacy. And that, that's a kind of a scary sounding title, but what it means is that they found an example of a problem that a quantum computer could do in a few minutes that would take a supercomputer hundreds of thousands of years. It, it was a kind of silly example. There was no obvious commercial application, but it was one example of something that a quantum computer could do that a normal computer couldn't. So that was a big milestone. We've seen extraordinary progress. I think many of you are familiar with Moore's Law, which has shown that traditional computers doubled in power every 18 months, roughly. Quantum computers, uh, just, just by IBM alone, they have doubled in power every 12 months. In fact, just two days ago, IBM announced uh, a big jump in their new quantum processor. Um, Honeywell has, uh, has increased by a factor of 10 every year for the past few years, and they think they can continue on that trajectory. We think that we are only about three to five years away from commercial applications. And uh, this is why we're encouraging companies to start now. Don't wait three to five years uh, to get into it. It takes time to develop applications and kind of build up your quantum muscle. And so we really encourage companies to start now. Um, IBM and Google both claim that they will have 1,000 qubit um, quantum computers uh, by the end of 2023. 20, and that would mean that we, we really could do some serious things with it. And they expect a million qubits by the end of the decade. So, uh, so we really are at this inflection point uh, to use this, uh, this, this term coined um, with exponential technologies and everything. The past few decades, there was kind of slow progress, but right now it's really ramping up. There is tremendous amounts of money and talent going into it. Um, two weeks ago, I was at a conference in New York and an analyst said that they counted, I think 395 quantum startups um, in, in the Western hemisphere. And uh, um, I don't even know how much money is going into this now. Yeah, I remember. Thank you. I, I remember. Uh, uh, I, I remember uh, uh, having a chat uh, actually four plus years ago with, with someone at IBM who is uh, who is the head of their global cyber uh, initiative, and he just casually said in the, in the context of the conversation four years ago, "Oh yeah, on our quantum cloud, we're running applications." I'm like, "What? You have a commercial quantum cloud?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah." Four years ago, he they were already you know, sort of that, that far along. So, uh, uh, but I, as, as you said, things, things are now moving uh, so, so fast that uh, uh, I, I guess, you, you know, a, a lot of participants need to think about. So perhaps you can unwrap it a little bit more. So if, if let's say, uh, let's, let's say a business let's, uh, would like to start getting uh, into thinking about how to go about and to, in, in the future, utilizing, let's say, quantum computing cloud, uh, do they need to hire new people? Do they need to figure out how to uh, write quantum code? Uh, do, what do they need to do? Sure, they should hire someone as a as a quantum lead in their uh, in their company to kind of take charge of everything, um, because there's a there's a misunderstanding um, in the public that you can just take normal computer software and run it on a quantum computer, and it's a million times faster. And that's not at all the case. Quantum computers are only good for very specific things. And we're still learning what those things are. There's no general formula for what things quantum computers are good at and what they're not good at. So companies should hire someone to kind of figure out how that company could benefit from quantum computing, uh, review all the algorithms that they're they're using and such. And then they should reach out to a quantum company that that writes quantum software and already has the expertise you know, what would be involved in developing quantum software and such and develop these types of, of partnerships, um, because it really does take time to do this. There are, there are a couple of questions that came through the chat as, as you were speaking. I think people are quite keen to, to understand, first of all, uh, how can quantum computers, uh, what can they do to uh, uh, sort of well-establish uh, cryptography and encryption? Uh, that's one question. and. Uh, and, and the second is, uh, can you speak a little bit about international, perhaps, competition in the, in the space of uh, quantum developments? Sure thing. So there is a very close relationship between cybersecurity and quantum. I think uh, 
that that's sort of the one thing that a lot of people know is that quantum computers can be used for hacking, and and there is a reason for this. Um, the formulas that we use to do encryption they're purposely so difficult that traditional computers can't undo them um, directly in any reasonable amount of time. It turns out those formulas, which we chose 50 years ago, happen to be formulas that quantum computers can undo directly. If you had a sufficiently powerful quantum computer, you could undo uh, many of the types of encryption that we use today. Now that that can't be done today, but in a few years, that could be a real risk. And so that's why computer scientists and mathematicians have already started developing encryption formulas, which we don't think quantum computers could hack. And you, you notice I emphasized, we don't think, and this is because we don't know for certain. This is such a new field that we don't know for certain. The US government agency NIST organized a conference a few years ago, and they invited submissions for these, uh, what are called post-quantum encryption formulas. So diff different formulas, uh, which we don't think quantum computers could hack. So there were over a hundred submissions, and then people did their best to test these. And last summer, NIST announced seven finalists. So there are seven that withstood the attacks and they're being investigated right now. And so we think in the next few years, one or two of them will be declared winners. Now, the good news is you don't have to wait until an official winner is declared. You can use these seven right now. They're publicly available and open source. And so you can install them um, as you wish. I would strongly encourage you to do this for two reasons. The first reason is because it takes time to make this upgrade. If you've ever been responsible for upgrading software at a company or a government agency, you know that it can take a long time. And the second reason is because there are rumors that hostile governments or terrorists or, or bad actors are archiving things right now in order to decrypt things later when, when technology catches up. So for both of those reasons, I would encourage anyone in a position to do so to upgrade security right now. Um, I think the second question you asked me was about governments. Global competition, global competition, global, global, global competition. So um, China is appears to be the leader from every indication that we have. Uh, they're, the government is basically writing blank checks. They're especially interested in quantum communication, which is unhackable for uh, like based on fundamental physics. And so uh, so China is a leader as far as we can tell. The Europe, Europe is probably second. Um, the U.S in some ways um, is, is really good, but in some ways not. Uh, Europe seems to get more government support, but of course the US has companies like Google and IBM and Honeywell and Microsoft who are who are very into it. Okay, so a, a lot of the developments happen as a result of sort of Manhattan type projects because government uh, sort of supports it and could, could pull together, you know, the most talented, uh, uh, the sort of uh, cryptographers and mathematicians. But on the other hand, uh, it's not necessarily uh, going to uh, result in, in 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 outright sort of outcomes that that would be uh, that would win, right? So it, 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 there is an there is sort of a race going on right now. There, there is very much an arms race. In fact, that's what we call it, the quantum arms race. Um, and there have been several articles about this: um, the the East versus the West once again. Very interesting. Uh, uh, Fascinating. I do. I do encourage participants to uh, to, to send their uh, to send their questions in the chat. We uh, uh, you know we'll, we'll continue talking, and and as the questions through the chat flash, I'll 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 I'll, I'll ask uh, the panelists uh, at at an opportune moment to to answer them. Um, uh, so maybe uh, go back to Dan. Dan, you know, it, it seems I, I you know you you you've talked about sort of the size of the crypto market and. And a bit about the regulation. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, uh, I, I, I've read somewhere recently that it seems that the uh, actually, and, and you also talked about the recovery of of um, uh, of Bitcoin post post the attack. That it seems that the majority of mining is now done in the U.S. Are you reading that too? Yeah, it's it's um, it's been interesting. I mean, there's obviously been an ongoing crackdown in China on uh, mining pools and miners. Uh, so apparently a lot of the activity has been shifting to the U.S. and increasingly creative efforts to co-locate with old power plants and try to use excess energy. 
uh, to deal with the high energy intensive aspects of, of Bitcoin mining. So so that's that's right. There seems to be a little bit more activity from a mining perspective uh, shifting to the U.S. You know, I had to say, I think we were all uh, hoping that you were going to ask that follow on question to Mark, because it's a, it is such an important subject. And, um, you know, Andre, sorry, I'm, I'm going to pivot for a quick second and just talk about CBDC for a moment. Uh, central bank digital currency, because I think that's so important. And the public private aspect when we talk about quantum is precisely the reason that we need to have a public private conversation around the future of money and the dollar itself. And I actually think the quantum uh, aspect is something that from a digital dollar project perspective, we have not, you know, put that as a top five issue yet to date, because we're working through a lot of the other kind of design choices and questions. But, but man, this, this issue is a big one and figuring out you know, to the whole point of you can't just flip a switch and then all of a sudden upgrade your software to start using quantum proof encryption. You know, how are we thinking about this from the dollar perspective? Because it's not just crypto, right? It's all financial markets. And oh, it's a payment. It's a, it's a payment. It's secure payment protocol, right? So, I mean, that's hackable directly. I mean, you don't need to go hack, you know, ASICs. You know, you can go direct into the payment system. No, that's exactly right. So it's, this is an issue that goes kind of far beyond you know crypto per se. But anyway, pause there. But I, I couldn't help but uh, at least comment on Mark's very uh, no, no. I think they're I think they're very much related. So it's slightly think, terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I think they're very much related. First, I mean, there, uh, of course, the question about mining. If you know, if if the uh, if uh, if if a significant amount of mining, let's say dominant amount of mining, shifts to the U.S., well, the now you have computers within your jurisdiction. You can do things with it, right? And at the same time, uh, you're also now with quantum computing, these computers are also subject to risks that are also within your jurisdiction. So these are these two things are sort of coming together as yes. well. Is that how you see it as well? Oh, I, I, I think that that's right. Um, and, I, and I do see the logic, you know, of, of talking about mining and, and what that means. I mean, but, but again, kind of regardless of where the mining is occurring, you know, the underpinning of, of the Bitcoin ledger, of course, is the integrity of that ledger and, and the potential to manipulate uh, or attack the, um, the the cryptography that underpins it is is incredibly tr- worrisome. Um, and so, again, you know, whether you're talking about crypto or you're talking about future proofing the dollar and a central bank digital currency, especially if offered in tokenized format, um, it's going to require this to be kind of a very a very real time and rigorous d- public private discussion. Um, you know, right now we're, we're awaiting the Federal Reserve Board's concept paper on CBDC, which we're expecting will be issued, you know, maybe by year end. And that's going to kick off a, a notice and comment process with the Fed. You also have the Boston Fed working with MIT on some of the technical standards. And I and, and certainly the, the, the issues that Mark's raising, you know, need to be part of this conversation now, because I, I suspect that the planning um, you need to start the planning now if you're going to be prepared three years from now, which is going to come much sooner than, than folks realize. You know, how how do you see the dog years of crypto and fintech? How do you see this public-private discussion just sort of being, being operationalized? Manhattan Project type of public-private discussion, multiple initiatives running, DARPA, you know, what, how would you operationalize it? Yeah, it needs Where to be exactly you- that. It needs to be exactly that. You know, when, when Chris Giancarlo and I, we wrote an op-ed about this in uh, the fall of 2019 in, in the Wall Street Journal, and we liken this to, to the, you know, the space race and moon landing like this. This does require precisely for these reasons that we were just talking about. It does require kind of robust public-private partnership support and discussion. You know, many people liken a lot of the developments today to the development of the Internet. And I think the analogy holds relatively well. Um, but when you talk about standards, when you talk about security, when you talk about interoperability, uh, all of that does require this robust discussion. And I will tell you, you know, I was a little concerned in terms of the state of the conversation. We were a few months ago, I think the country was going down a dangerous path of making the issue of CBDC very uh, almost political and black and white. You know, there was this prevailing idea that on, on the one hand, some suggesting the only way a central bank digital currency could be issued would be directly through Fed accounts, which of course would be quite destabilizing to the existing two-tiered banking system and the way that people access banking services today. On the other hand, you had some people saying there's absolutely no role for the public sector. You know, this is this can be purely a private sector conversation. Um, from a digital dollar project perspective, we are certainly very supportive of private sector efforts that I think are kind of pushing these conversations to the fore. 
whether they be cryptocurrencies or private stablecoin efforts. That's what's getting people to think about the future of money. Um, but the right approach is to realize it's got to be a mix of the two. Uh, you can certainly distribute central bank digital currency through the existing two-tiered banking system. It doesn't have to be kind of a zero sum where it's like, oh, this is a Fed accounts or it's fully private sector. Um, but to answer and handle some of these really difficult technological questions, you want to draw on the private sector as well. I mean, the, the work that's being done, you mentioned Honeywell, you know, Google, IBM, we should be pulling from the best of that's being developed in the private sector and make sure that you're future proofing the dollar. I mean, it's, you know, the reserve currency status of the U.S. dollar will not change overnight. I, I think a lot of this, well, it, it should be evolutionary. I mean, you worry about things like quantum computing, which is what just paused me when I said it doesn't change overnight. Um, but you need to be doing the work now so that it is that Manhattan Project type effort uh, so that you really kind of solidify what the standards are going to be for future financial market and services infrastructure. Because I think that's what this is all about. Uh, privacy expectations, protection, security, uh, interoperability. Again, those are big, thorny, difficult issues. And you don't just flip a switch and have that operational tomorrow. I know there are, there are a few questions for you that, had, that came uh, through the chat. They, they are, uh, if I understand them uh, correctly, uh, they're a bit more about the economics of, of DeFi and whether, you know, there, there's a question that came through, is, is DeFi basically hyper-financialization of um, that, 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 that just sort of uh, it exists in its own parallel universe outside of anything real? And uh, then there is another question that on, on uh, flash loans, on DeFi lending, and how is it done and, and how big is it and, and just sort of uh, uh, that sort of thing. Do you want to tackle that? Uh, yes. So, uh, so, so on hyper-financialization, -financial um, um, we may say that it is a parallel universe, uh, but in a way, this is what uh, we could have said about the original, you know, the, uh, about the iOS ecosystem, you know, for mobile apps uh, on, on Apple uh, when it was starting with iPhone 2 and iPhone 3. You know, we don't really need that. This is just separate thing. It is duplication of what we are doing otherwise. And then it took off and it's, and it's, and it's quite large. Uh, we may have, uh, we, we may have it as a parallel, uh, universe, but it is engaging a substantial amount of, uh, financial resources. Uh, where people are, you know, spending and engaging their their attention and and resources, and they are um, also withdrawing those resources. So, it's uh, it still is connected to the uh, to the regular uh, regular activity, and uh, it is fueling a lot of uh, a lot of innovation. Uh, so I think that maybe at the moment it is parallel universe, but we have a you know a large number of markets like this. I mean, isn't art market just a parallel universe uh, to everything else that we do? Uh, so uh, so this so, so 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 this is kind of to say that it's uh, it shouldn't be dismissed as just just a parallel universe. Um, on flash loans. Uh, flash loans are uh, are used. Uh, I don't have estimates. They are used. They are used increasingly. Uh, there are only some um, some activity uh, that are lending themselves to use of flash loans. So you need to execute because you need to execute a flash loan within one transaction. So there is only some type of activity that you can do with a token within the same transaction. Um, and and that means that we don't know yet what will be the potential of it. I'm I'm just so surprised by the use of technology in this way uh, that eliminates the risk. And I think that there will be new creative ways to use this uh, risk elimination. I mean, the, the flash loan is one example. Smart contracts is another. Uh, in, in in general terms, like I mentioned, and um. Uh, in in other aspect, this is another example of eliminating risk by technology, and I think that this may have far uh, far going consequences as we develop this technology and use it in more uh, more applications and apply it to uh, to other transactions, not just executing arbitrage or voting with voting tokens, because those are the two examples that I have seen most uh, on Ethereum network so far. 
so I just got corrected. I think Andre missed the point, which is about distributional effects. The question is whether it will benefit anyone outside of the large capital forces and further extend wealth disparity. So the, I think the claim is that there's just a small handful of participants in the DeFi space who are basically uh, running sort of pump and dump type of schemes. And uh, it's, it's really not for, for, for really anyone else to, to get into. Uh, is, is, is that your feeling or, or you feel well, you so my, my feeling is amount of innovation? <laughs> So, so, so my feeling is actually opposite on the, both on the users and on the provider side of DeFi. Uh, I see a large uh, portion of young people taking part in it. So I would say that, uh, that most of my students are participating in DeFi markets and they, they may be, they, they do have some, uh, you know, mon monetary gains from it. Uh, they are also issuing, uh, DeFi, they are creating DeFi applications. They are setting up smart contracts. So I don't know how limited it is, or is this just going to be a generational difference in, uh, in how likely young people are to engage with, uh, with, with DeFi applications and therefore gain from them? Excellent. Thank you. Chris, uh, the question came through uh, the uh, the chat that I think is probably you you, you might be uh, the best person to address about uh, digital identity developments. Yeah, I mean, I think identity is at the core of you know launching any type of fintech um, or or DeFi sort of retail consumer solution. In in, in many ways, it it. Um, it remains a, a largely unsolved problem. Um, you know, we can we can get a passport, a physical passport. We can get a physical driver's license, but somehow um, asserting our identity uh, digitally is is very challenging um, from a usability perspective for most consumers. I think it's still something that we need um, both government and industry participation in to to, to properly solve it. You know, and and I've seen it firsthand on the fintech side where. You know, banks have networks that can establish identity and they have longstanding identity um, integration and history. Um, but when new solutions pop up, they tend to they, they tend to get the brunt of uh, the fraudsters because they don't have as many protections. And so we, we certainly need this. Uh, the uh, a question came through in the last uh, little bit to. Uh... Uh, to, um, uh, I think, Mark, to you, uh, I think somebody is really excited about your, uh, your, your, uh, your points and says, you know, how long would it take if, if the person knows basic math and, 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 and can code a bit to, uh, to get into a uh, sort of quantum computing? It wouldn't take that long if they already have a math and physics background. What I would suggest is go to IBM's website. They've put so much information online for, for free. There's a lot of uh, examples and notebooks and such, and you can even use their low-end machines for free. And so that would be the best way to, to start getting practice in this. Um, there, there's a lot of blogs now, a lot of newsletters and such. So it is accessible. Fantastic. I, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jalapa as well. I'd like to thank all the, all the panelists for... Uh, uh, for you know, amazing uh, points uh, that that you made. Uh, each one of you, if you wish to do so, or you can skip it, has uh, you know twenty to thirty seconds to make final remarks. Dan, any final remarks? Sure, twenty seconds. Um, no, I, I think. Look, my big takeaway from this, and it kind of goes back to the thing I said at the beginning: is are we asking the right questions? And I think you know, there, there, you just separate a little bit here what the current activity looks like, what the assets that are being traded and the, the substantial risks that may be posed, I think, to Todd's point. Uh, and I see another comment here. There's some concern about what are these assets? What are these instruments? Is it safe? Do people understand what they're getting engaged in? And those are very fair questions to ask. At the same time, I find in the, lo the long term is the infrastructural piece of this, like this automation of certain market functions. I don't think that goes away. I think that gets adopted by a lot of legacy exchanges systems um it's go we talked about central bank digital currency i think all of these different areas are much about the infrastructure and the plumbing and what does it mean and what does it mean about 
you know, the new intermediaries uh, that we're dealing with, how do you regulate them? How do you incorporate that into the, into the regulatory framework? Of course, I was more than 20 seconds. I can't help myself, but thank you. Anna, I knew you would be. <laughs> so, so I would say that uh, in DeFi and, and blockchain in general allows, you know, I would emphasize that, that it, it gives rise to new markets and we should watch out for them. At the same time, uh, what Dan said is we have this infrastructure, we are building infrastructure together with those applications. And this infrastructure with all the, its benefits is going to be one way or the other, uh, one, one way or the other, uh, uh, taken uh, advantage of also by the existing players. So we are not going to see this contrast as, as we are seeing right now, DeFi versus traditional financial services, like what Chris said, you know, this convergence of crypto and traditional markets have been happening for cryptocurrencies. We are going to see it for automation of uh, financial services and use of this shared infrastructure uh, through blockchain. Thank you. Chris. So on a macro level, um, what I think we're seeing here is what Mark Andreessen wrote uh, a few years ago, basically that you know software uh, is eating the world. And now that software has come for money, um, things are about to get really interesting. We won't be able to predict the types of changes we're going to see, but it will definitely be interesting. Super, Mark. Quantum computing is here. Uh, it could be three years, it could be five years, but it definitely will make an impact in the next two years. If your company hasn't already developed a quantum strategy, they should. This should be because uh, you could benefit from quantum computing and you have to understand that, or you might be vulnerable to attacks from quantum computing and you have to understand that. But either way, you should develop a quantum strategy. Thank you very much. And on that, I'd like to put, please put your hands together for our wonderful panelists and uh, back to you, Jalapa. Thank you very much. Great discussion. Uh, so we are going to take a 15-minute break.